Shavuot Sameach. All right, Baruch Hashem. I cannot believe you, all of you are here at 3 a.m. in the morning. Baruch Hashem. I want to tell you that I have drink, I've so far, uh, I was going to say drinking, drunk. I don't know. How, I'm from Texas. I don't know how to speak English, but I've had like four or five espressos, okay? And I hope that's humanly safe. Let's open up in prayer. We're going to explore the secret of Sinai. You actually heard Rabbi Shapira say the word secret of Sinai earlier. We want to explore this. And well, let's open up in prayer. Avinu Shabbat Shemayim, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I just pray for all of us here together, everyone here in person and everyone online. I just pray that your Ruach HaKodesh, your Holy Spirit, your Shekinah will touch them and will touch their heart and fill their heart, Lord, and inscribe your Holy Torah upon our heart. We love you, God of Israel, and I just pray that these words will be your words and not mine. I pray, Lord, that you will open our eyes to wonderful things in your Torah. Blessed are you, Adonai, King of the universe, giver of the Torah. We love you, God of Israel, and we praise you. Bizachut Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen Amen. Amen. We're going to open up with a quote from uh, Rebbe Nachman. He says, just as breathing sustains each person, whether one is conscious of it or not, so to Mashiach, the world's ultimate rectification, the ultimate tikkun, has sustained the world from its inception, whether we are conscious of it or not. This is really amazing because Lamentations chapter 4 verse 20 says, Wuachapenu Mashiach Hashem, the spirit of, of our nostrils, the breath of our nostrils is the Messiah of the Lord. I want us to think about this breathing, this concept of breathing, this breath, this... If you just breathe in just for a moment, just take a, de a deep breath. Uh, breath, breathing is, is regulated by our subconscious. One way to, and when you pray, one way to really um, tap into the subconscious is to, is to control your breathing, is to focus your breathing. It's very important when we pray. Breathe in, breathe out, and when you breathe in, realize that you are breathing Mashiach. Mashiach Hashem, Ruach Apenu, the Messiah of, our, of the Lord is the breath of our nostrils. Look at this. Here is Rashi commenting on Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, that says, V'ruach Elohim merechefet the Spirit of God hovers over the face of the waters. He says, the throne of glory, Kisei Akavod, was suspended in the air and hovered over the face of the water with the breath of the mouth of the Holy One. Blessed is he. And with his word, like a dove, which hovers over a nest. I want you to think about this, like a dove, keyona, like a dove. What does that remind you of? Where do, you get, where do we get this idea, like a dove? Uach, where, where does it come from? Where do we know this from? Did you, in the Gospels, Yeshua goes into the waters and at the Jordan. He goes into the waters and he emerges up from the waters and the Spirit comes upon him, hovering over the waters, just as it did in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, upon Mashiach. Why? Because he is triggering and initiating the new creation, the Briah Chadashah, the new creation. So I want us to look at this. There is an ancient Midrash, an ancient gospel that is called the Gospel of the Hebrews. I want you to hear how it renders this particular passage. It says, and it came to pass that when the Lord was come up out of the waters, the whole fountain of the Holy Spirit descended upon him and rested on him and said to him, My son, in all the prophets was I waiting for you, that you should come and I might rest in you. For you are my rest. You are my first begotten son that reigns forever. I find that to be so beautiful. This was, the, this was an ancient Hebrew gospel called the Gospel of the Hebrews. It's only preserved in fragments of quotations from people who lived from very long ago. This is so beautiful because Yeshua is triggering the new creation. And we open up creation. Rabbi Shapira mentioned it earlier. With 10 words, God created the world. And that's amazing because in 10 words, God gives us the Torah on Mount Sinai in, in the 10 commandments, the 10 words. And then we have the 10 attributes of Hashem. And we have all of these levels of 10. But when we open up Genesis, it says, Vayihi ere, vayihi voker, yom echad. The next day it says, yom sheni. Yom Shlishi, Yom Revi'i, Yom Chamishi. And look at this. This has always blown my mind. I've never really understood the secret of this. If you notice, it says Yom Hashishi. Does anybody see anything unusual about this? I know Rabbi Shapira does. 
But does anybody see what is unusual about this, this particular word? This letter here has the definite article exactly. No other word has that definite article. There is something very special about Yom HaShishi and what is the secret of why God put the sixth day? Ha means the. Why did he do that? So look at this. Here is the Talmud. Uh, Shabbat 88a. It says, Reish Lakish said, What is the meaning of that which is written? And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. The sixth day. Why do I require the superfluous letter hey? Why do, what is, why do we have this extra letter hey here? You must know that every single letter of the Torah is, has a very specific meaning. Something you will never see come across in, in English. Okay? Maybe every once in a while they'll get it right, but this is so critical for us to understand. This particular word. Why? Because, this, it, because, he says, it teaches that the Holy One, blessed be he, established a condition with the act of creation. And he said to him, if Israel accepts the Torah on the sixth day of Sivan, which is tonight, is today, you will exist. And if they do not accept it, I will turn you back to the primordial state of chaos and disorder. Therefore, the earth was afraid until the Torah was given to Israel, lest it return to a state of chaos. Once the Jewish people accepted the Torah, the earth was calmed. This is amazing because this tells us that the existence of the world depends upon the Torah. Okay? Now, now the letter Vav is the, is the number six. On this day, the sixth of Sivan, what is so special about this letter? What is, what is so special about it? Earlier, Rabbi Shapira mentioned Yom Abikulim, the day of first fruits, the day of the first fruits of the wheat harvest. Okay? Here it is right here. It says, on the day of the first fruits, when you offer a Offering of new grain to Hashem at your Feast of Weeks, at your Shavuot, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work, but offer a burnt offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Again, we have something that is unusual here. We have this extra vav, this spelled in its Malay form, it's spelled complete. You can spell the word Ola without the vav. Why do we have the vav here? Listen to what Rabbi Aaron Raskin says. He says, the letter Vav is like a shoot. A shoot is a, a tsinor, a conduit, a ladder, alluding to God's descent upon Mount Sinai. It is like a ladder alluding to Moshe's ascent into the divine presence. Vav means a connecting hook. It is the letter that connects words together. This alludes to the power of the Torah to connect godliness with space and time and to connect previous generations with present and future generations. Did you know today that the souls of every single person who would receive the Torah stood at the foot of Mount Sinai with all Israel and said, Na'asei we will do and we will hear. This is why the Ola, this offering, the ascension offering, has this extra vav to hint that on the 6th of Sivan, God came down and gave us the Torah so that we and all future generations could connect with him. Do you know what the letter Vav means in the deeper Torah Tasod, in the secrets of the Torah? It means the sun, S-O-N, the sun, the heavenly man, okay? Which we've been, we've been counting. I hope that all of us has been, have been counting the Omer. Who counted all 49 days? Baruch Hashem. Then we have a few, counted all 49. And as you count, what do you do? You go through the attributes, right? You go through the Midot. This midot, every single day, if you did the, the devotion on this, there's this aspect of, of uh, Joseph within David and, and all the different attributes. The word midah has the gematria of 49. Okay? 49, 7 times 7, what Rabbi Shapira said was absolutely 100% true because the level of the 50 is the level beyond time. 7 times 7, 49 brings us to the level of the 50, the level of the Yovel, the level which is beyond time. Do you know what Rebbe Nachman says? He says, if you believe in Hashem, Mashiach, who is, who is beyond time, and the world to come, which is beyond time, you, if you truly believe in this, he will say to you, you have, you have become my son, you have become my child, I have begotten you, and you will become born again. Because these words refer to Messiah who can bring us to the level beyond time. And so this level of, this, of going through the 49 levels, reaching to the level of the 50, re refers to reaching the level of Mashiach, who's the only one 
who received the 50th gate. Moshe Rabbeinu got to gate 49. Mashiach received the 50th gate. As it says in Daniel chapter 7, it says the son of man, Kavar Enosh, that he was like a son of man. He came all the way up to the Atik, to the ancient of days. That is mind-blowing. The gematria of Sinai equals Sulam, equals ladder, the ladder of Jacob. It is so incredible. Sinai is the ladder. The ladder is Mashiach. As he says in John 151, you will see the angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. In the book of Genesis, it actually says that you will see angels going up and down on him. As Jacob said, it says in the English, it will say the angels were going up and down on it. But in Hebrew, it's the word bo. It means on him. This is absolutely incredible as we have this concept of, of, of Moshe going up and down, ascending and descending, and Mashiach making the full expanse of all, of all of creation, all the way to the highest aspect, all the way to the lowest, and then returning back to the highest aspect. This is remarkable. Because he himself is the great connector. He is the Vav. He is the son that connects heaven and earth just as Sinai did because Mashiach is the embodiment of Sinai. Mashiach is the embodiment of Sulam. The Zohar says the Sulam is prayer. Prayer is that which connects heaven and earth. This is what Sinai is. On this day, we officially receive the Torah from God. Until Sinai, no one can bring heaven to earth or elevate earth up to heaven. Before Sinai, a person could do a mitzvah, yet the object with, with, the, with which the mitzvah was performed remained mundane, chol. On Shavuot, God came down upon Mount Sinai, and Moshe represented the people in particular and the mundane world in general, and he went up to Sinai. The encounter empowered the chosen people with a golden touch, a power to transform mundane physical matter into something holy, into something kadosh. What is the opposite of holy, common, exactly. It is something we can understand the concept if we understand its opposite. It means something common. The Jewish people have the ability to elevate the world from the common to the holy, which leads us through the level of the 49 up to the level of Shavuot, the level of the 50, the level beyond time, the level of Mashiach. We celebrate Shavuot. Here's a... Um, Rabbi Shapira made a, 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 I can't even say it in English, a, a mnemonic, a, a memory device earlier. Here's the memory device, acharit. It means that we say the akdamut, which is a piyut on Shavuot. We eat chalav. I hope everybody just ate a bunch of chalav and now feel very warm and sleepy, right? You should have had five or six uh, espressos like I did, all right? We read Megillat Rut, which we're going to do. Yerek, which is greening, this idea of, of just flowers. When Mount, si Mount Sinai, God gave the Torah, the Midrash says that it even smelled so incredible. The sense of the Garden of Eden return. The Reach of Gan Eden returned upon the people. is remarkable. And we study the Torah. We go through and we uh, unlock the Torah all night, just as we do tonight. In the Mishnah, so tonight, it says, Torah study leads to care in the performance of mitzvot. Care in the performance of mitzvot leads to diligence in their observance. Diligence leads to nekiyut, cleanliness of the soul. Nekiyut, cleanliness of the soul, leads to perishut, abstention from all evil. Abstention leads to purity and the elimination of base desires. Purity leads to chasidut, leads to piety. Piety leads to anav, humility. Humility leads to yirat chet, fear of sin. Fear of sin leads to kedushah. Kedushah leads to the Ruach HaKodesh, and the Ruach HaKodesh leads to the resurrection of the dead. Who wants to be resurrected? Did you know there is a Midrash that says that when all Israel was standing at the foot of Mount Sinai, that they were resurrected on that day, that they experienced a born-again experience, becoming resurrection, Tachi at the May team, of, of the resurrection of the dead. Do we want to experience this? I know we're sleepy, but do we want to experience becoming awake to the spiritual world, to coming, to receiving the fullness of what Messiah has given us? We have the opportunity. This is something huge. I'm going to challenge the Messianic world today. I'm going to challenge the Hebrew roots world today. I'm going to challenge the non-Jewish world today. I want you to show, see and learn. Come and see from the Jewish people 
I want to tell you something remarkable. Look at this. Israel encamped there in front of the mountain. Do you see anything unusual about this? Israel encamped there in front of the mountain. Look at the Hebrew right here. Vayichan. You see the word Vayichan is in the singular. It's very interesting. Why didn't it say, and they all encamped? As I was talking earlier, up in New Jersey. We got people from Jersey here. How about that? From Jersey, right? We say, use guys. Well, in Texas, we say, y'all. All right? But in this particular verse, it's in the singular. I want you to see what Rashi says. Here's Rabbi Shlomo Yitzhak. He says, Ke'ish echad belevechad. And he was, and all Israel was as one man with one heart. Ish echad belevechad. With one heart. I want you to pay attention to this. As one man with on one heart, but in all the other encampments, there were complaints and dissension. How many of us are complainers? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> all right? How many of us are dissenters? Don't raise your hand. And I want you to look at the Messianic and the Hebrew words, roots world, and I want to ask you, what is the characteristic here? There is not unity. There is not unity. And that's something that we must understand from the Jewish people. We must understand and connect to the Jewish people and realize that if we are in Yeshua, we have been grafted in, non-Jewish people, grafted in to the holy root of Israel. To the Jewish people. We are responsible to support the Jewish people. I love it when Rabbi Shapira said, we cannot tell, the Messianic world cannot tell the Jewish people anything until we get our act together. It's key. It's so important for us. We have to get our act together. We must be achad, belevachad, ishachad, belevachad. We must be as one man with one heart. And when we, are, when we do that, we unlock the ability to receive the Ruach HaKodesh. We unlock the ability to receive the Torah on Mount Sinai. Everybody wants the, the Shavuot experience, but we must be a Chad to receive it. It's so key for us. I want you to look at something. Acts chapter 2, I want you to see something really amazing. It says, when the day of Pentecost arrived, Bayom melot shivat ha-shavuot ne'esfu kolam levechad. Look what it says. And when the day of Shavuot arrived, they were all together in one place. You see what it says here? They were all together in one place. Look what it says in here. When the day of Shavuot, Nesfu kulam lev echad. You see that? They were all in one heart. The early believers were in the temple. They were all together, always continuously praising God as one man with one heart. And this allowed for the Ruach HaKodesh to be poured out upon them. Yeshua says, my, uh, the world will know that you are my disciples when you are all as one. And then the world will know. And then the world will know that Hashem is, has sent Yeshua, okay? What does that tell us? That tells us that we have the mafteach, we have the key to redemption, and it's in our hands. That tells us something huge. That tells us something shocking, is that the... The delay in the Geulah, the fact that the Geulah, the redemption, has not happened yet, it's on our side. It's, the ball is in our court. It is up to us to connect and to be all together with achdut, with brotherhood, all of, all of us together, yachad. When we sing the song, hinei matov, manayim, shevet achim gam yachad, how pleasant it is and how good it is for brothers to dwell together b'yachad in unity. There is one thing that is lacking in the Messianic world, is unity. And that is heavy for us because that shows us that we are the ones holding back the spirit from unlocking into the world. We blame the, the political forces in America destroying America. These things are absolutely happening. You look at that, you look at these horrible things that are happening in the moral world, all this moral breakdown, whose fault is it? Is it the atheist? It's us. The judgment starts here. It has to be us. We have to be the ones who are coming together to receive God's spirit, coming together as one man with one heart. It is so important for us to connect to the Jewish people and to learn the Torah from the Jewish people. We have to do that. We cannot continue in this goyishkeit, in this very Gentile way of trying to do things. There is a right way to do it. And this is where we receive the Torah. God spoke all of these words. Listen to this. When God gave the Torah, no bird twittered. 
No fowl flew, no ox lowed, no, no, none of the angels stirred a wing. The seraphim did not say, Kadosh, Kadosh, holy, holy. The sea did not roar, the creatures did not speak. The whole world was hushed into breathless silence, and the voice went forth, I am the Lord your God. Something remarkable about this. It says, Ani Adonai Eloecha. That is something shocking. When you read your thing, this in the Hebrew, he says that I am your God and it's in the singular. It's in the singular because all of Israel is one, but it's also in the singular because this is directly addressed to you. Exactly what Rabbi Shapiro said. This is to you. Hashem is your God personally. He is your personal God. And he wants to meet with you as he says, I will betroth you to me in righteousness. The tablets, oh, just look at this, look at this. The tablets of God. We're going to talk about the tablets, but look at this just for a moment. It says, behold, my word is like, uh, behold, is my word not like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that shatters a rock? If your heart feels hard like a rock, like a salah here, Hashem's word can shatter it. Hashem's word can replace that with a heart of flesh, a heart, a new heart. Just as this hammer breaks a stone into several fragments, so too each and every utterance that emerged from the mouth of the Holy One, blessed be he, divided into 70 languages. Why would Hashem give it in, in 70 languages? So that the whole world would hear the word of God. So the whole wor world would know the standard which he set forth because this God's word, given through the Jewish people, is for every single person. As it is written, and the word of God came out of of, out of Zion, with the Var Adonai Mi'ushalayim and the Word of God from Jerusalem, it is so key for us to be the conduit through which that happens. Listen to this: When God gave the Torah on Sinai, He and He displayed untold marvels to Israel with His voice. What happened? God spoke, and the voice reverberated throughout the world, as it says, and all the people saw the voices. Ve'kol ha'am ro'im etakalot. Notice it doesn't say hakol, the voice. It says kolot, the voices. Rabbi Yochanan said that God's voice, as it was uttered, split up into 70 voices in 70 languages so that the nation should understand. When each nation heard the voice in their own vernacular, in their own language, their souls departed except to Israel, who heard but were not hurt. I want you to hear this just for a moment. When God spoke on Mount Sinai, he spoke in 70 tongues at once. Loshanot, Loshanot, Kolot. All of these voices, all at one time, it came out as Hebrew and then it divided like a tree into all the linguistic branches. I don't know if you've studied linguistics, but scientifically, it can be traced, all languages can be traced back to an original language which absolutely is Hebrew, okay? And this is remarkable because you see what it says here in their own vernacular, in their own language. Look at what Acts chapter 2 says. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other languages as the Spirit gave the ability to speak when the sound was heard. What, how do you say sound in Hebrew? Does anybody know? It's the word kol, right? When you hear the sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because everyone heard them speaking in his own language. You see that? in his own language. Look at the Midrash, in their own vernacular. Is the Midrash quoting Acts chapter two? When you see this, this is absolutely stunning. If you're sitting in, the, if you're a Jewish person and you're reading Acts chapter two for the first time and you know uh, the Torah and you know the Midrash, you would be stunned, you'd be shocked because you would hear the echo from Sinai. You would see the Jewish background, the foreground, the tapestry of the New Testament. This Hebrew New Testament is so beautiful. We're going to hear, and we've, uh, we've heard Matthew cantilated. That's been my dream for years, and tonight it has happened. This is remarkable. We are living in prophetic times. We're living in times that the whole Messianic movement is being challenged to move forward because where are we going when we move forward? We're, we're going to the redemption. We are preparing to receive the Messiah. We are preparing to receive the Torah again. I want us to look at this. The Midrash explains when God decided to give the Torah, he approached all nations with the proposition, do you want to receive the Torah? Each nation effectively replied, it depends what's written in it. This is unreal. 
It's, sh it's shocking. I mean, when God enumerated the obligations of the Torah, each nation in turn declined by replying, if that's what's in it, it's not for us. Then God approached the Jews and said, would you like to receive the Torah? The Jewish people replied, we shall observe and we shall listen. No questions asked. You know the Psalms say the angels, they do and then they hear. Matter of fact, when the angels heard all of Israel at the foot of the mountain say, Na save Ishma, they were shocked because that's what the angels say. How many of us want to say, Na save Ishma? I want to tell you what it means. And, and I think Rabbi Shapiro alluded to it. It's when somebody, it's like Hashem, puts the ring on, uh, offers the ring and says, Will you marry me? Na save Ishma says, I do. This is a way of saying, I do. Now, I want you to think about this here just for a moment. Everyone else said, I want to know what's in the contract. I want to read the fine print first. I, I want to make sure that there's no clauses. I want to look into it. Israel didn't do that. They said, we trust you so much. We don't even know what's in it yet. Now, nah, save any shema. Whatever you want to do. How many of us are ready to say that? How many of us are ready to give our lives to Hashem and say, I trust you? To say, I trust you. I trust your plan for my life. I trust your word in my home. I want to raise my children from one generation to the next. The rabbis say that that's why Hashem gave the Torah to Israel. Because they, Hashem says, I will give you the Torah, but I need guarantors. And all of, his, and all of Israel said, well, the Avot, Avraham, Isaac, and Yaakov will be our guarantors. So these are not guarantors. They'll, they need guarantors. And they says, well, what about earth and heaven? They'll always be here. These are not good guarantors. What about our children? And then Hashem says, these are good guarantors. It is given to us that we can give it to our children, door la door, from the next generation, raising up a new generation who are probably, almost certainly, going to see the return of Yeshua. And if not, all of us together. But are we going to do it separated? Are we going to do it in strife? Are we going to do it in dissension? Are we going to do it in all kinds of things against the Jewish people? Chaz v'shalom, the anti-Semitism, even in the Hebrew roots world is shocking. We must uproot this and totally allow Hashem to put a new heart within us. Uh, make a tikkun for this. We cannot do this. We must say, yes, I'm from the nations, but I want to follow your path. I want to make a tikkun for this. We are at the time, through Yeshua, that he has prepared all the nations to receive his word, to receive his plan for our lives and to support the Jewish people and to receive and bring the geula, the redemption, now. This is where we see the tablets were the work of God and the writing was the writing of God engraven, charut, upon the tablets. The word engraven is the word charut. Charut. Listen to what the rabbis say. Pirkei Avot. Read not charut. Engraven, but cherut, freedom. For you will find no free man except for him who is occupied in the learning of the Torah. I want to tell you, I did not come to the Lord until I was 18 years old in my life. And Yeshua reached down into the absolute darkness of the world and pulled me out of it. And I want to tell you, I've already seen what's on the other side. I've already been in the, the, the depths of darkness in the Gentile world. I want to tell you, that's absolute slavery. The Torah brings freedom. It is not bondage. That is the biggest lie we've been told. It's bondage. Misinterpretation, misapplication, absolutely. But through Hashem's instruction, through His Spirit, through His guidance, it's freedom. Matter of fact, look what James says, Yaakov. He who looks into the perfect Torah of freedom and continues not being a hearer who forgets but a doer of the work, this man will be blessed in what he does. Look at what Yaakov, Hatzadik, Look at what Yaakov, the brother of Yeshua, quotes. Look at this, Torah Tachirut. He uses the exact same teaching at the same time. This idea that the word engraven, this is where he gets it. Torah Tachirut, the engraven Torah is the Torah of freedom engraven upon our hearts. The point of Kabbalat Torah, of the receiving of the Torah, the word Kabbalat Torah means to receive the Torah in Hebrew. At Har Sinai, at Mount Sinai, was not just to inform B'nai Israel of the mitzvot of the Torah, the reception of the Torah, the receiving of the Torah also instilled in B'nai Israel an eternal emunah, a faith in Hashem and in Moshe Rabbeinu. Torah and faith must go hand in hand. We have been taught that Torah and faith are opposites. 
Chaz v'shalom, chaz v'chalila, they are hand in hand. If a person learns Torah as an academic discipline, or keeps mitzvot only out of social ritual, but does not actually believe that the Torah and the mitzvot are from Hashem, then clearly his observance is hollow. Similarly, if a person has faith in Hashem and does not translate that faith into action by studying the Torah and observing the mitzvot, then his faith has no practical value. The easiest way to ex explain this is... There's a community that comes together and prays for rain, but only a little girl brings an umbrella. The whole community has belief, the little girl has faith. It's very simple. Action, faith, and munah is belief and action. We must do actions. It's not enough for us just to have a mental acknowledgement, which is something very goyish. The, the Jewish world is very action-based. We must do the action if we really believe it. There are those who would say that the main thing is to be a Jew at heart or a believer by extension, a believer in Yeshua at heart. It's all, it's all that matters and only the heart. These people assert that it's unnecessary to perform the various mitzvah acts. They distort the vital principle that the merciful desires the heart. He does. Absolutely. There's many religious people who are not, not, not um, connected to Hashem. It's very harsh. At the same time, though, there's many people that, that, um, that Hashem, he desires, he desires all of our hearts to mean that a person's mitzvah acts are not essential. Some people think that. All, all that matters is the heart, mitzvah acts are not essential. The reason they, that if they grasp the abstract, abstract purposes of the mitzvah, it is no longer necessary to actually do it. Have you heard this? It only matters the heart, you don't need to actually do it. Okay? The only way to uphold the words of the Torah is to do them. And this is a challenge for us today. We must do them. We must put God's word into action in our lives and translate that to our children. Our children learn so much, not just from our words, but from our actions. Okay, not only just our children, but every single person we come into contact with sees us. And they say, oh, this person's religious, but look how he, he uses bad words. Look at this person who's supposed to be religious, look how he acts, look how he doesn't... Uh, Maybe he steals or, or speaks Lashon Hara about other people. Chaz v'shalom, chaz v'chalila, God forbid. Do we then overthrow the Torah by this faith? Chaz v'shalom, by no means. On the contrary, we uphold the Torah. Romans chapter 3, verse 31. Paul himself is saying we uphold the Torah. Now, what does it mean? It's just not about the external only, though. It's hand in hand, faith and action. Go hand in hand, they are a chad. I want us to look at something. In Judges chapter 6, verse 34, it says, And the Spirit of Hashem came upon Gideon, and, and he blew the shofar. You see this? How would you say it in Hebrew? V'ruach Hashem lavsha et Gideon v'tika v'yitcha b'shofar. And the Spirit of God, it doesn't say came upon it clothed him, but it, wait a minute. If you look at this, the way I read this is the Spirit of God put on Gideon like clothes. Lavsha et Gidon. Gidon is the, is the object of the action. All right? The et is the accusative particle. Uh, Gidon is the, is the object. The ruach is lavsha is putting on Gideon. Do you see this? I want to tell you something. Matter of fact, look right here. Lavash means to dress, to wear, to clothe, to put on clothing. To put on clothes, to wear. The Spirit of God wore Gideon. I want to tell you something huge. The Spirit of God wants to wear you. The Spirit of God wants to put you on his clothes. The Spirit of God wants to fill, wants to fill you, to enter into the most innermost sanctuary of your heart, the Kodesh, I call the shame of your heart, and it wants to put you on like clothing in order that you will do God's ratzon, God's will in the world and bring tikkun, olam. Yeshua said to all the believers after the resurrection, Shalom lachem, shalom aleichem. He said to them, when he said this, he breathed. On them. Remember what we said, the breath? And he said to them, receive the Ruach HaKodesh. Receive the Holy Spirit. Listen to what the rabbis, listen to what the rabbis teach here. They say, Mashiach's breathing, 
will have a very positive effect on mankind. The breath that Mashiach will breathe will emanate from the Torah and its 613 meets vote. This is the spirit of God that hovers over the face of the waters. The spirit is Mashiach and the waters of the Torah. Mashiach's spirit is embedded in the Torah and he will draw his breath, the Yirat Shemayim, the fear of God from it, the awe of God from it. And with this spirit, he will be able to breathe into others filling them with awe and respect for God. This is a Jewish text. This is a Jewish text that seems to be almost quoting John, but it's not, but it's telling you the exact same thing. Messiah wants to breathe upon us and tell us to receive the Holy Spirit. Tonight is the night of the bride. Listen to this. I'm going to read Revelation chapter 21, and it says, I saw a new heaven and the new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming at, down out of heaven, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband, the wife of the Lamb. And it says, and he carried, away, carried me away into a high mountain. And he showed me the holy city coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone and like the stone of a clear, crystal clear jasper. And it goes on and describes the most beautiful new Jerusalem that is woven into all the Midrashic texts. Listen to this in the Zohar. It says, when the bride is destined the next day to be under the chuppah, the canopy with her husband, to be with her all night, delighting in her adornments in which she is arrayed, arrayed engaging in Torah, from Torah to prophets, from prophets to writings, midrashic renderings of verses and mysteries of wisdom. These are her adornments and finery. We read in the book of Revelation, the righteous acts of the saints, the righteous acts of the tzaddikim, the ma'asim tovim of the tzaddikim, the righteous acts of the, of the righteous ones are the linen garments of the bride. When the bride is aroused to canopy, enter the canopy the next day, she is arrayed and illumined with her adornments. And as soon as they join together, she sees her husband. How many want to see Yeshua? The groom entering the canopy, the glory of God, the glory of the bride. This is exactly what we read in the book of Revelation because Hashem wants to breathe upon us and wants us to say, Na save nishma, I do. He wants to come into the chuppah on this day that he gives us the ketubah. He gives us the ketubah at Mount Sinai. Why did he do this? In John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, Bereshit haya hadavar, v'hadavar haya ima Elohim, v'Elohim haya hadavar. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was, was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made through him, and without him there was nothing made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word of God, the Torah, became flesh and dwelt among us. I want to tell you what this means. Yes, Yeshua, the primordial Torah, the embodiment of the Torah, the instrument through which all things were created, came down and dwelt among us, but he did so, so that we too would become a living Torah. God wants to write his word upon our hearts, that we too will become a living Torah, that the Torah will be made flesh in our lives, that we will take his Torah and make it real, that he can repair the world through us in the merit of Yeshua. He will put his Torah within us and will write it upon our hearts and he will be our God and we shall be his people. Amen va amen. Amen. Avinu Shabbat I pray for every single person here that they will receive the Ruach HaKodesh, that they will receive the breath of the Messiah that breathes upon us from the 613 meets vote of the Torah, that we will receive the Holy Spirit upon our hearts and become a new creation, and that every one of us will become a living Torah like Yeshua, our Master, transformed, every one of us, from the darkness of the world into the holy light, to the level of the 50, to the level of Shavuot, to the level beyond time, to the level of receiving your holy word back to the garden, back to Jerusalem, that we can all become the bride for your holiness. And we love you, God of Israel. And I just ask you to bless every single person here with your holy word, with your holy spirit. And may you breathe upon us this night. And may we receive your holy spirit. May we receive your holy Torah written upon our hearts forever. Amen, but amen. Shavuot Sameach.